Pizza Flix presents Classic Movie Monday. Remember that under our Constitution, all men are born equal, and that you are a jury of the defendant's equal. Many points were brought up by the district attorney to which the counsel for the defense rightfully objected. Questions of that description may create bias against the defendant. Such bias, which unfortunately cannot be forgotten, must be carefully guarded against in your verdict. The evidence brought out by the prosecution is of a circumstantial nature. You must therefore decide was the defendant, Cassidy, beyond a reasonable doubt at the scene of the crime when the deceased met his death. The subsequent evidence is also circumstantial, and again you must decide if those events, those exhibits which you have seen, can be a series of coincidences or absolute proof of the defendant's guilt. Keeping these things in mind, you will now retire and consider your verdict. Everyone will remain seated the jury has retired. Let me see. Boy, you caught his character to a T, Adrian. Boy, he's a peach of a study. And speaking of tea and peaches, how's about some lunch? Starved. Well, is the pride of the star, to say nothing of the art department, ready to eat? Now, uh, let's leave Baldwin out today. I'm tired buying his lunch. Why don't you learn how to toss? A guy would need double-headed coins and loaded dice to play you, and then he'd lose. Listen to the piker moan. Where do you suppose Jim got his name Lucky Baldwin? The Greeks had another name for it, and so have I. <laughs> hey, you better give Cassidy some of your luck, Jim. He's gonna need it. <laughs> a famous judge once said, Providence alone knows what a jury's going to do, and I sometimes doubt that. Yeah, but Cassidy's head's in the noose, or I miss my bet. And yet the state has actually proved nothing. I tell you, it's wrong to hang a man when the evidence is purely circumstantial. For the love of Pete, are you started again? Come on, Adrian. It may be absolutely convincing, damnably conclusive, but it's still circumstantial. Here's some sugar spike. Sugar? Coming up. Very good, very good. You know, where it's even possible that somebody else could have committed the crime, life imprisonment should be the limit. Uh, a blind dope could see that Cassidy is guilty. But that is not Jim's point. The man could be innocent. Well, that's what juries are for. And if they find him guilty, it's up to the judge to hang. And that's what I object to. Oh, get a soapbox. You've gone bugs on the subject. Yeah, why lose your head over an execution? <laughs> yeah, I guess I am a bit loony on the subject. Uh-oh. Baldwin does not pay. Odd man out. Head. 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 Tail. Tail. Head. Tail. Looks 
like you and me, Adrian. Lend me your lucky coin, Jim. No, you don't. You call. T -t no, heads. Heads it is. Looks like I'm elected. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. We heard Spike the first time. What do you mean the first time? I can change my mind, can't I? Providing you have one. Ah, baloney. <laughs> Come on, I'll shoot you some food. Oh, oh give me that thing. Come oh, on. no. Don't you know the woman always pays? Well, we'll make this the exception that proves the rule. Oh, but I'm not an exceptional woman. Well, I think you are. Ouch. I left myself wide open for that one. <laughs> You're not usually in such a hurry to get back. Well, I'll tell you. I got some serious talk for you, young lady. And after all, where is a better place for calling than a courtroom? I feel strangely interested. Proceed. Well, will you be serious for a minute? <laughs> you know, you seem to be the only one in the world who doesn't know I'm in love with you. Well, how could I know? You never mentioned it. I thought women were supposed to have intuition. Well, there were times when I may have suspected it. Ah, you did not. But then I said, no, no, not Jim Baldwin. Not that died in the wool bachelor. Say, are you trying to kid me out of proposing to you? No, I'm trying to kid you into it. Do you mean that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Remember where you are. Oh, sure. But didn't I say that a courtroom was the place for courting? Well, what's the matter? Didn't you like it? Yes, but I was thinking of something else. Well, that's fine. Um, you're very fond of Fred Stevens, aren't you? Certainly. Why? Well, he proposed to me last night, and I refused him. Fred? Yes, do you think it'll make any difference? Well, I knew the guy liked you, but I had no idea it was serious. So you turned down <laughs> a guy with national fame for me? Oh, you're worth a dozen columnists. <laughs> oh, no. Fred's a sweetheart, if there ever was one. We'll have to tell him when we go back to the office. Here comes the jury. They must have reached a verdict. Everybody rise. Be seated. You may proceed. Mr. Foreman, have the jury agreed upon a verdict? We have. And what is the verdict? We, the jury, find the defendant, John Cassidy, guilty of murder in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, John Cassidy, guilty of murder in the first degree. So say you all. We do. Prisoner will rise. John Cassidy, have you anything to say before I pronounce sentence upon you? I am innocent. The court will now proceed to impose sentence. It is therefore the sentence of this court that the prisoner, John Cassidy, shall be put to death during the week beginning June the 12th, 1935, in the manner and place indicated by law. You are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. Everybody rise! Fred now? Might as well. He's got to know sooner or later. Take our troubles to Mexico. Such is not the case. It's Reno. Oh, hello there. Grab yourself a chair. You're just in time to break the monotony. Well? What's the matter? <laughs> well, I don't know. I doubt a start. Well, it's about me. Fred, we've got some bad news for you. You don't mean to tell me you're engaged. <laughs> but why come to me like a couple of criminals? Congratulations, Jim. Thanks, Fred. 
and all the happiness in the world to you, Adrian. And Jim was so afraid you'd feel badly. Well, naturally, I feel a loss. But if it couldn't be me, well, the best man won. Cupid's Notebook. Miss Adrian Gray, the beautiful young lady whose spirited drawings are becoming known from coast to coast, has murmured yes to Jim Baldwin, the boy who makes the stars shine. Oh, Lucky Jim. <laughs> hey, cut out that Lucky Jim stuff. Well, you are, aren't you? <laughs> sure, but in the song, Jim went to an early grave and his pal married the widow. Oh, so that's why you sang Lucky Jim. <laughs> Wretch. <laughs> oh, oh, pardon the crash. Uh, the boss wants you in his office. George or Mr. Winters? Uh, Mr. Winters, George is in with him. Sydney, the city editor's name is Malone to you, not George. Oh, that's just the freedom of the press. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, tell her what a lovable character I am. Oh. oh, Adrian, I'm very happy for your sake. Thank you, Fred. I'm going to try it. That's what I want Baldwin for. Good evening, Mr. Winters. Yeah. Well, did you get the Cassidy case out of your system? Not quite. I'm working on a special for circumstantial evidence. Oh, still harping on that, eh? Uh, Jim, I was just telling George about a new plan of mine. But before telling you, what do you say to a little drink? No, thank you. I'm on the wagon. What? I want to save my money. When a reporter goes on the wagon, it's new. And when you want to find the cause, seek the woman. <laughs> well, you won't have far to look. It's Adrian Gray. Well, congratulations. Thank you, sir. A reporter's got no business getting married. Well, you did. That's why I know. <laughs> married life isn't always easy, Jim. We only get out of it what we put into it. The best I can wish you is that you'll be as happy as Mrs. Winters and I have been. Thank you again, sir. Now, this calls for a little celebration. I'll send for Adrian. Ask Miss Gray to come in. Would you mind asking Fred Stevens also? And Mr. Stevens. You know, I always thought Stevens had his eye on Adrian. Well, that's why I wanted you to ask him. I mean, uh, we've told him, but I don't want him to feel that he's left out. And won't Mrs. Winters be thrilled? You know how women are over a wedding. I'm afraid she would have favored Fred. Oh, no, no, she's very fond of you, too. I know she'll want to give a party to announce her engagement. My very best wishes, Adrian. What's this? What's this? Oh, goodness, does everyone know already? Who's been doing all the broadcasting? <laughs> well, I said I was going on the wagon, and George had such a fit, I had to tell him my reason. Yeah, he had to tell. Deeply shameful, I suppose. Yeah. Hung his head like a turkey gobbler. <laughs> well... Here's my sympathy to both of you. <laughs> you. Just ignore him. I asked you in to wish you both every happiness and prosperity. That thing around the corner. Yes, George. The corner they both decided to turn. To a happy future. Thank you. Oh, Chief, I got the lowdown on Mrs. Goodwin. I'm interested in only one woman. And if I don't work quick, I shall lose her. I didn't know you were the marrying kind. Huh? Uh, get out. Get out! Mulgrew! Mulgrew! Where's my dinner jacket? Charming. I'm not surprised Mr. Bowen can't take his eyes off you. <laughs> oh, you're wrong, Mrs. Winters. I was just wondering how much these gowns cost. You know, in the future, I'll have to buy them. You will not. Do you think I'm going to stop drawing? The only <laughs> things a wife draws are checks. Oh, fine. Well, I'll leave it to any married man in this room. <laughs> will you get a wife's bank? I'm afraid the only thing she'll draw will be a blank. <laughs> oh, yeah? Glass of punches. <laughs> oh, thanks, Sid. I don't know what we do without you, darling. Oh, it's the same in the office. I often wonder how they got the paper out before I went to work there. You want to know a secret, Sid? 
We were always late, but then we got the latest news, and that's what made us famous. <laughs> now I'll tell one. <laughs> Excuse me, please. Here at last. Trying to be fashionable or pretending that you're overworked? <laughs> Hello, Fred. What uh, kept you? Oh, garnering gossip. Oh, about the perennial frailty of woman. Uh, did you say frailty? <laughs> I think the modern woman shows a lot of backbone. <laughs> we pay him money for things like that. Fred, come to my sitting room a few minutes. Let me see your ring. Oh, I think it's lovely. Are you going to have a church wedding? I think I'd like to. The men seem to regard it as purely a civil ceremony. I hope you're going to forgive me for being late. That is, if you knew I wasn't here. Oh, yes, we knew. Because everybody spoke without fear of being quoted. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, George, we can have the whole country talking about the star. Every other paper quoting it. I'm looking for my wife. Then there must be something wrong with you. Oh, you don't know her. She's pretty as a picture. She's French. Come on, let's go someplace where we can talk without being disturbed. necessity to hang over Adrian Gray all evening, you know. My dear Bernice, she is the guest of honor. I had to pay my respects. <laughs> respects. Ralph said he thought you were in love with her. Husbands are easily deluded. Under the circumstances, that's just cheap vulgarity. <laughs> oh, I see. Bad morals are forgivable. But uh, not bad manners. Oh, Mr. <laughs> you must behave yourself. <laughs> Shall we tell that guy where his wife is? Hell, ignorance is bliss, and a bird in a hand is worth two in the... Oh, well, you know the old saying. Sure. Rolling stone gathers no moss. That's it. Pardon, Mrs. Winters, I thought this was the dressing room. Oh, that's perfectly all right. We were just discussing that etching I bought today. Frank considers himself an authority, but I like your opinion. It's a Rene, isn't it? Yes, it is worse. He is usually more decorative than good. No, oh, you are critics. Well, I like it. Now run along, Fred. Adrian wants to powder her nose. But don't put that in your column. Powder doesn't interest people. They want dynamite. <laughs> Come along, darling. Go easy with the propaganda first. Hit him with cases in history where justice is miscarried. That'd be good stuff for any paper. Hey, can't you fellas stop talking shop for one evening? Nobody can stop Jim when he gets on his favorite subject. Mr. Winters, we have to put an end to the death sentence on circumstantial evidence. Well, but it's very seldom that the murder's actually seen. Certainly, but there can be other proofs. Circumstantial evidence is no proof. The name itself admits that, and death is too final. It's supposed to be. But when a mistake has been made and the innocent man is in jail, the state can do something to rectify the injustice. But what can you do when the guy is dead? Well, he has an argument. Take a recent case, where a man was in the penitentiary for 12 years before the real murderer was found. Did the state apologize? It made generous amends. It could, because the man was alive. Then again, take one of the most famous cases in history, the case of the Lion's Mail. Yeah, I can just remember Sir Henry Irving Flake. There never was a tighter chain forged around any man. The real murderer and the accused might have been twins. They dressed alike, even to the exact buttons on their coat. Endless incriminating circumstances dovetailed into apparent proof that sent the doomed man to the guillotine. Another innocent victim of circumstantial evidence. Jim, let me think about it. It would be a great boost to the circulation of the star. We certainly start people talking. Yeah, and thinking. Fred, come here, I've got an idea. And is it a honey? It'll make it twice as famous. How? Your name will be on everybody's lips and the circulation of the star will double. <laughs> Suppose you come on down to Earth. Now, what do you want me to do? Disappear. We'll stage what looks like a murder. Why? Then I'll be tried and sentenced to hang. I don't see what you're getting at. I want to build up a case of circumstantial evidence against myself for your supposed murder. Huh? Then you'll show up and that'll prove my point and end capital punishment on circumstantial evidence. Uh, it would never work. 
Somebody would be sure to give us away. No one will know. We won't tell a soul. What is your plan? Well, first we'll pretend to quarrel and everybody will think it's over Adrian. I couldn't have thought of a better scheme myself. Let's start it now. The setup is perfect. We can work on the other details later. You're just a rotten double-crossing rat! Adrian knows you're nothing but a muckraker! Ah! I'll get you for this if I have to swing for it! Jim! in the world has come over you? Well, you must apologize. That was an awful thing to say. Apologize for what? I had no idea you could be like this. So you're taking his part. Well, I wouldn't apologize for you or anybody else. Jim, I'll give you one more chance. Will you apologize to Fred? No. Oh, now, wait a minute, honey. Too bad Adrian had to take this attitude. Yeah, it kind of hurts. Where's that guy Moglu? Tell him to get me another drink. Oh, I had to fire him. I'll get you one myself. Uh, make it straight this time, will you? You know, I'm going to go through with this thing. I'm not going to back out now. Well, then, let's get it over with. I think we played for effect long enough. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's talking about the bad blood between us. If it weren't for Adrian, it would be funny. Mm. Well, success. Well, I'll run down to the office when you come in with the glad tidings. <laughs> Some actors. We ought to be in pictures. <laughs> yeah. So long, Barrymore. Hi there, boy. Is there a brewery in the neighborhood? No, but I think Jim's buying one on the installment plan. Getting any dope for the boss? Plenty. What's the idea of the gun? Oh, I've been to some pretty queer places lately. Is that the only reason? Sure, what a reason would there be? You don't think I'd bump myself off over a gal, do you? No, but we all heard you threaten to get Stevens. Well, maybe I will yet. But don't worry. When I do, I'll have a good alibi. Ah, slaves. Behold the newest member of the landed gentry of America. That's nothing. My father's a member of the women of the world. <laughs> now I know where he got the material for your head. <laughs> now what about this uh, landed gentry stuff? Wait till you see my country estate. Ah, Adrian. Squire Stevens at your service. Squire? Oh, yes. I just went to the lovely place in the country. Adrian, could you give us a cartoon of Stevens as a country gentleman? That would be a laugh. Omit the country and it'll be a bigger laugh. You said a mouthful. I, 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 uh, I suppose you'll fill it with skeletons and mummies. Uh, oh, yes. I thought of inviting you all. Ouch! <laughs> oh, enough of this. Make it Saturday and the gang will all be there. I'll get back to work, all of us. Uh, Adrian? Yes, Fred, I'd be glad to. Jim? You couldn't pay me to. Why didn't you answer my last note? That's another indiscretion. You seem to have a 
sudden concern for my reputation. My dear Bernice, why is it a woman can't reach the end of a liaison gracefully? Because when a woman begins a love affair, she feels somehow there'll be no end. Well, now you know there is. Oh. And after all that I've... Oh, well, that's easily rectified. First, here's the watch. Hey, Here, quick, get this way. Welcome. Did you have any trouble finding the place? Half mile past the gas station. Here we are. Six and a half roadhouses, exactly. Pardon me, but what's half a roadhouse? Well, we only saw the front of the last one, and you said it was a flop for want of backing. But you stopped at the other six. Oh, yes. It's unlucky to pass a roadhouse. You always get a flat tire or something. You always get a flat tire if you pass a roadhouse. Who told you that? A man who owns one. Well, I'm going to have a drink. I don't know what you guys are going to do. Say, do you know where a guy by the name of Stevens lives? Yes, half a mile down the road. See, you're the second car that's been in here tonight asking for him. Yeah. Was it a woman? I'll say. Class to her. Driving a special job that must have cost ten grand. Yeah, he knows them all. One of these days he's gonna get his. Can't be much farther. There's a gas station now. Yep. Only half a mile more. There's Jim, stop! It looked like his car. Or what he wouldn't come within a hundred miles of this place. No, I don't suppose so, but I could have sworn it was he. Oh, here you are. I thought you were lost. How did you ever find such a beautiful place, Fred? He probably looked through a keyhole and there it was. Spike, remember you're supposed to be on your good behavior. Ladies, right. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, left. Oh, it's all right. You can go in there, too. I'm sorry, Jim didn't change his mind and come to the party. I can't understand him. Is there anything I can do? To me, there's only one thing that matters, Adrian, and that is your happiness. Oh, you've been splendid, Fred. I don't think there's a jealous thought in your whole makeup. Jim, you saw. Who saw him? Where? We thought we passed him at the gas station. Yeah, I believe I saw him too. That's strange. Very strange. But don't let's worry about it. Let's have some laughs. Come on. as soon as you can. Oh, I'm all right. Feeling great. Oh, sure, I know you're all right. Do you think we 
You should leave Fred in that condition. Sure, he's all right. Come on, let's get going. We've had a grand time, Fred. You know my only regret. Are you sure you're all right, Fred? Wouldn't you like Spike to put you to bed? I feel insulted. Out upon thee, and remember you're driving the most charming girl in the world. I guess you're not so drunk at that. Good night, Fred. Good night, Fred. Going like clockwork. Here, too. You were seen at the gas station and on the road. Oh, that's swell. Say, that girl saw me at the window. Yeah, and she recognized her. <laughs> well, I'll plant my bones. <laughs> now, that's really a thing. <laughs> Looks like you've been on a diet. <laughs> Did you bring the broken cup, Link? Yeah. Here it is. That won't burn it. I'm sure to find it. If this won't look like a murder, nothing will. <laughs> I'm as good as hanged. <laughs> You know, it's a shame to burn this place. Oh, it's worth it, all right. I'll go and get the oily rags, and you better open the windows to make sure there's a draft. Hey, you better beat it, Jim, so there'll be no chance of our being seen together. Okay, Fred. I won't see you again until you come to life. And if by chance you want to get in touch with me, for heaven's sake, don't forget my name. John Blythe, Palace Hotel, San Francisco. <laughs> don't worry, I won't. So long. So long, Jim. I'll see you in jail. We've been trying to get you for the past 12 hours. Yeah? Well, who wants to know? We do. Well, hello, boys. What does the detective bureau want this morning? Coffee? This is serious, Jim. Did you read about Stevens? Yeah, yeah, his uh, house burned down. He just moved in, too. Yeah, we found his remains in the ruins. Is that so? You don't seem to care much. Why should I? He was no friend of mine. So we understand. Stevens was murdered, Jim. Well, that wouldn't surprise me either. You were seen around there last night. You're trying to pin this on me, you're crazy. Sit down, take the load off your mind. You don't seem to take this seriously, Jim. But I tell you, you're in trouble. Don't make me laugh. Just because I have a quarrel with a guy and his house burns down and you find a few bones, I'm a murderer. I'm not talking about just bones. Look at this. We found one half of the cufflink beside the body. The other half in your room. What of it? I admit I was there last night. I went down to patch up with him. He'd been drinking. We got a little nasty. We had a scuffle and I lost my cufflink. But when I left him, he was just as much alive as you are. In fact, I'll even make it stronger, as I am. Can the sarcasm. 
You were seen sneaking around the house, and when the party was over, you shot him in the back and set fire to the place. Come on, admit it. You threatened to get him, and you did. We've got the gun. What gun? Don't try to kid me. The only gun I ever owned in my life is right in there. They trace that gun yet? Save yourself a lot of trouble, Jim, if you'll confess. You mean I'll save you a lot of trouble trying to prove a case? I think it'll be pretty easy. Hello, this is Taylor. Have you traced the gun in the Stevens case? Okay. The gun was bought by Baldwin ten days ago. That was just after he threatened to get Stevens. So you found my gun? He didn't tell me about that. What's that? Oh, nothing. And I suppose you found the bullet lodged in his brain? No, it went right through him. We haven't found it. Well, that gives me some hope. Yeah, but not much. Uh, Jim, I think you better come along with us. I hope you boys have swept out a nice room and bath for me. You got me beat. I didn't think you were a tough mug like this. Say, an innocent man has no right to fear the law, right? That's right. right. Well, then let's go. Jim. It's all right, Ken. What's the matter? They've been questioning you? Yes. Spike and I were the last to see Fred alive. We had to identify the body. Couldn't have been much left with a lot of charred bones. Jim, how can you? Fred, it was ghastly. His back was horribly burned, but not his face. What are you talking about? Talk sense, Adrian. You mean to tell me that Fred's body was actually found in the fire? That, that you could recognize it? Well, I thought you knew. Knew what? There were only supposed to be some bones. Don't tell me that Fred is dead. Better come along, Jim. Oh, get away. You're crazy. Don't you realize somebody killed my pal? Cut it out, kid. Come along with us. Oh, you're nothing but a bunch of numbskulls. Never had any brains you never will have. I can clear myself. I'm not worried about that. We staged the appearance of a murder. We never quarreled. That was all a frame. Sure, I was seen around the house in the gas station, and we planted some old bones of a skeleton. The cufflink was my idea. Fred must have thought of the gun afterwards. I left him when he was to set fire to the house. Then he was to go to San Francisco and hide out until I was to be hanged. Oh, yeah. But well, what was all this for, Jim? To prove the weakness of circumstantial evidence. Don't you remember the argument? That's a new alibi, all right, but who's going to believe it? Well, I was prepared, not for this, of course, but something else might have happened. Well, can you prove that, Jim? Certainly. Run over to Hope Hardwell and Williams and engage them to handle the case. I left a sealed document with them which explains the whole thing, and it's signed by Fred. So long, honey, and don't worry about a thing. Pretty clear. How would you know? Come on, lock me up and get busy looking for the real guy. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the cleverest, the most diabolically conceived crime in the annals of criminal history. You have heard the extraordinary defense of the accused, the devilish cunning with which he obtained his victim's signature to that now famous document. That is, if it is not a forgery. Now, even if you believe the testimony of the handwriting experts, handsomely paid by the defense, that the signature is genuine, can Fred Stevens bring his foully murdered and burned body back to life to tell you that he knew what he was signing? Or knowing it, have we any reason to believe that he did not walk blindly into a trap contrived with hellish cunning by this friend who threatened to kill him? No, ladies and gentlemen, that famous document upon which this prisoner bases his defense is not worth the paper on which it is written. All in fun. Yes, of course, it was all in fun that he took the girl his victim loved with a pure, unselfish devotion. All in fun. It was all in fun that they quarreled about her. He asks us to believe that so that he can prove that you and you and you are mental incompetence that the juries of our nation are incapable of distinguishing between guilt and innocence. You are on trial as well as this prisoner. You are on trial for your intelligence. The state rests.
The prisoner will rise. James Richard Baldwin, you have heard a jury of your peers find you guilty of murder in the first degree. Have you anything to say before I pronounce sentence upon you? Your Honor, there is only one sentence you can impose. But before you do, I beg the courtesy of the court. In spite of all the circumstantial evidence I built up to prove a point, I am innocent. It was a stunt, an attempt to jolt people into realizing the viciousness of this kind of evidence. And I still hope it's going to work. It seems a strange time to say that I'm happy, but I am. I'm very happy over the faith shown by my friends. And I know that one at least will never let up until the actual murderer is brought to justice. Two things must be changed. First, the elective office of district attorney, where regardless of justice, it becomes the politician's sole object in life to obtain convictions, whether they're right or wrong. Justice has no place in the DA's thoughts, only convictions, and through convictions, publicity and political advancement. And the second is the change in the penal code, making it impossible for an innocent man to be sent to the scaffold on circumstantial evidence. If these things are done as a result of this trial, well, then I won't have been a total flop. That's all, Your Honor. The court will now proceed to impose sentence. The defendant will be put to death during the week beginning October 18th, 1935, in a manner and place prescribed by law. You are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. Court dismissed. A lady and a gentleman to see Baldwin. Someone to see you, Baldwin. Oh, tell him I'm not home. Hey, wait a minute. Give me a little argument. I'll come out. Adrian. Good old Spike. <laughs> I was a sour stomach. Okay, Jim. Jim, we filed an appeal. And it won't be long now. And Mr. Winters is getting the best detectives in the country. And we're doing some investigating ourselves. I've been doing a little figuring, too. You know, all I do in here is eat and sleep. And, well, I figured if I ate enough, I'd get too fat, they wouldn't be able to get me through the doors. If you get too fat, I won't love you. And I'll go on a diet right away. Make a note of that, guard. From now on, lamb chops and pineapple. Yeah. Don't lose your sex appeal. Or any other kind of appeal. So when is that motion for appeal going to be heard? Next Monday. Say, did you find that uh, mugloo, that slant-eyed servant that Fred used to have? No, but we will. He disappeared very mysteriously. You know, I can't figure it out. Somebody must have bumped Fred off by mistake. Oh, well, we'll find out, and when we do, we'll... You and I'll... Boop, boop, won't we? Of course we will. Time's up. Say, Kelly, if I stick my face through there, will it be all right if she kisses it?
Surely you could spare the life of a man against whom no crime has been proved. We've gone over all that, Miss Gray. Has any new evidence been uncovered? But what can I do? Mr. Winters has tried to hire the best detectives and they won't even take his money. His is a sadly misplaced friendship. He's offered me every inducement that a publisher can offer a politician to commute the sentence. But I can see no extenuating circumstances. One more week. I'm sorry, Miss Gray. Oh, please, please, not tomorrow. Kindly escort Miss Gray to her car. I know, it's terrible. But how can I be flippant when my pal is in the death house? Oh, you write it. Go on, Scram. Come in. Why didn't you say it was you? I was just about to have a little snifter. When it looks of things, you need one. Governor turned me down again. Well, I'm on the right track. You know, Stevens wasn't the fair-haired boy we all thought he was. What do you mean? Well, I was just talking to a guy that did all the dirty work for Stevens. Some mug named Harris. Oh, I heard about that connection, but I didn't know how far it went. Well, it went plenty far. Stevens' men were out to get Jim. He told Harris. His latest victim was Mrs. Goodwin, and I think she did it. I've got a couple of the boys on her trail, and if she makes a break to get away, they'll grab her. Where in heck is that bottle? Spike! Huh? Look at this! B. Spike, Mrs. Winter's name is Bernice. Oh, Adrian, after all. Oh, I have a reason. At the party that night, I came across them together in her sitting room. And now that I think of it, it did look suspicious. Gee, that would be tough on old man Winters. Oh, well, we can't help that. Jim's life is at stake, and only a few short hours left. Well, what are we going to do? There's a desk in her sitting room which she keeps locked. I'm going to rifle it tonight. There may be evidence, her own writing, letters from Stevens. You're going to break into their house? Certainly. So it's you. Is this part of your profession or merely an avocation? This is no time for the niceties of sarcasm. 
I came here to pin the murder of Fred Stevens on you, and I succeeded. I think you exaggerate. Not a bit. I can prove that he was your lover. And a very deceitful one. You wrote a note to him saying you would do something desperate. You wrote here that you were going to have it out with him. You asked at the gas station the way to his house the night he was murdered. And there is the watch he wore until that night. It's true. I did go there that night, but before the party, I had every reason to want to kill Fred Stevens. But someone robbed me of the chance. I left before the first guest arrived. And I never saw him again. If you want proof, I had charge of a stall at a charity bazaar that night. And after I left him, I went there and was seen by hundreds of people at the time the murder was committed. Here it is. It must have been three in the morning when we left, long after the fire was discovered. I've been perfectly frank with you, Adrian, because it is best. But I want you to guard my confidence. I know, dear. It's ghastly. Oh, good evening, Mr. Winters. Oh, good evening, Adrian. Hello, my dear. I met Mrs. Winters in the elevator and she asked me to come up. I suppose it was because I looked so miserable. But I can't help it. That was very nice of you, Bernice. The strain is telling on all of us. Let's go into the living room. I think a drink would do us a lot of good. You want a drink, Baldwin? You can have as much as you like tonight. No, thanks. You look like you need one more than I do. My nerves are all right. Boy, but this place has sure made me change my thoughts. You want to make a confession? No, I have nothing to confess. But I don't see why I have to die to prove something that will be forgotten the moment another murder is committed. Meaning which? Mob hysteria, that's what. Do you know that they cheered in the theaters when that Cassidy verdict was announced? Why not? He had it coming to him. All right, say he did. But is that an excuse for cheering, hysterical blind lust? A yelping, howling pack tearing at their quarry? They should have prayed for his soul, but no! Kill him, a Roman holiday! <laughs> Hooray! Oh, well. It's a grand old country, and I hope they remember. Nos moratora te salute, Thomas. What lingo is that? Well, it's a little Latin I still happen to remember. Caesar's victim said it 2,000 years ago. We who are about to die salute thee. Appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, Moja. Thought you were fired. They took me back. I just started. That's swell. Order for Kelly. What do you want? Warden wants to see Baldwin. Come on out. The warden wants to see you. Do you think it's a reprieve? It might be, but I don't think so. The warden doesn't send for a guy to tell him that. Thanks. Get going. doing with Baldwin. Warden wants to see him. I'll sign the book. Let's go.
Hello, warden's office? Say, did you send Mosier for Baldwin? Mosier? What are you talking about? He'd have to break in to get back here. Well, that's what he did then. And now he's breaking out with Baldwin. just outside the city. I'll have the driver drop you off, and you go right to Winter's penthouse. Winter's? Yeah, that's the guy that's putting up the dough. Sure pays to have wealthy friends. Hurry up and get into your clothes. We'll soon be there. Thinking, thinking. There must be something we can do. If Mrs. Goodwin is guilty, we must delay the execution until we can prove her guilt. News flash. Pardon the interruption, ladies and gentlemen, but we have just received the following dispatch from the Press Radio Bureau. Baldwin, the murderer, escaped from the state penitentiary tonight on the eve of his execution. For further details in the late edition of the news. He's escaped. Oh, I must find him. He'll need help. Jim's on his way here. Was it your plan? I mean, you helped him to escape? Oh. It worked, it worked. Mrs. Goodwin made a break for Europe and they grabbed her. We'll have a confession any minute now. Oh, Spike, Jim has escaped. No. Yes, and if Mrs. Goodwin confesses, he need never go back. Hello? Yes, he's here. Spike. Mr. Horton speaking. Why, you dumb cluck. Mrs. Goodwin wasn't even in the state the night Stevens was murdered. Won't you confess? No. Taking a little trip, Mosier? What's it to you? What do you want? Oh, just a little talk. You dicks are getting too fast for me. It's okay, honey. I'm out. That's the main thing. There's not a chance of him following me here, thanks to Mr. Winters. There's no use in me trying to tell you how grateful I am to you, sir. Everything went out as arranged. Perfectly. I think you'll be safest here until the first hue and cry is over. After that, we can arrange to smuggle you out of the country. Oh, but the important thing is to prove his innocence. And if we fail, well, they'll never take me back there. Oh. Still lucky Baldwin. <laughs> How's the old dyspepsy? Say, you know that bird Stevens? 
Must have been an absolute Jekyll and Hyde. Why, any one of a hundred could have had a good reason to bump him off. Yeah, but only one did it. We gotta find that one before the cops find me. That's right. What's the matter with you? You got the jitters? Oh, no, I just forgot to shake my medicine bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jim. Stay where you are, Baldwin. Oh, yeah? Don't, Jim, don't! Officers, you you got the wrong man. I shot Stevens. Ralph, you're delirious. You don't know what you're saying. He didn't do it. Don't believe him. It's a noble thing to give your life for a friend, Mr. Winters. But you're just taking the rap because you're dying. We'll send up a doctor. Come on, Baldwin. Wait. That's no use. There's always a motive for a murder. We've proved Baldwin. I killed Stevens. You know what you're saying. You're branding yourself as a murderer. Why should you kill Stevens? But there is a motive. She's right. I am the motive. I didn't think my husband knew. Bernice. Bernice. <laughs> Darling. Everything's all right now. If Jim will forgive me, Jim, I never thought anyone would be accused. It's all right. I understand. Oh, don't. Don't worry, Mrs. Wonders. The doctor will be up in a few minutes. Okay, Chief. Take it easy. Well, Jim. You proved everything you said about circumstantial evidence. Yes. But the cost was too great. 